Good, e good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cuyahoga Heights Board of Education uh, regular meeting. We are in the Bonner Ray Media Center. It's 7 p.m. And Mr. Muccio, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Utter. Here. Mrs. Shuker. Here. Mr. Suchaki. Here. Mr. Naaman. Here. Mr. Dobbins. Here. Five present, none absent. Um, I, on behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. The board values and encourages public comment education, on education issues. Anyone having an interest in the actions of the board may participate during the public comments portion of this meeting. Please identify yourself on the sign-up sheet, which is what I was checking just a few minutes ago. Uh, it's a yellow piece of paper back there on the credenza. Uh, a copy of the meeting agenda is available to review on our school district's website. Uh, please silence your cell phones during the meeting. Thank you. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> May I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Mr. Raymond makes a motion. I'll second it. Second. Oh, Ms. Ms. Shuker seconds. Oh, we're good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Oh, that's okay. We're plenty of opportunity tonight. Okay, so uh, the motion um, has been seconded. Do a roll call. Mr. Naaman. Aye. Mrs. Shuker. Aye. Mrs. Utter. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. And now we move to the portion that we referenced earlier about comments from the public. Um, I didn't see anyone sign in as of a few minutes ago. Is there anyone that wanted to speak tonight? Come on, Ken, this is your chance. Open mic. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Okay, so we we can conclude that there are there is no uh, public comments tonight. So let's move forward, and we have some presentations tonight. Uh, first up is the Drug Free Clubs, Drug Free Clubs of America recognition. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Great turnout. Uh, awesome to see everyone here. Um, so real quick, we're going to start off tonight by recognizing 32 students, 32 pretty courageous and pretty bold students who made the decision to join and really help kickstart a drug-free clubs of america chapter here at kind of high middle school we're also going to be recognizing uh, a corporate partner for us on that and that's uh, we have two members from the cleveland clinic foundation who have been incredibly helpful and supportive that's so we're going to be recognizing them as well um, i want to start off and i guess peel back a little bit and just talk about the, the genesis of it and provide a little bit of background on drug-free clubs of america and here forth, I'll be referring to it, referring to it as DFCA. For the Council of America is quite a, a mouthful. But um, with respect to DFCA, um, it, it, it kind of came about this way. Um, you know, as a school leader, as a principal, it is very, very easy, I would argue, probably a little too convenient for, for someone in my position to keep uh, substance abuse and drug addiction at kind of an arm's length. Um, right now, we're really, really, we're in a really fortunate time here at Cuyahoga Heights. It's not really a problem for us. Um, but I would contend that now is the time to kind of take those proactive steps and, and, and address that before it becomes before it becomes a problem. Again, as a school leader, it's easy to kind of paint it as something that is outside my scope of responsibility. It's it's a family matter. It's a societal problem. Um, I'm not that school leader. We are not that school community, as you all know. Uh, at Cuyahoga Heights, we believe the school should be partnering proactively with families to do everything we can. Uh, to help make sure we're creating the conditions for our kids to make <coughs> decisions inside and outside of school, especially as something serious as where literally lives are at stake. Um, that being said, it is a difficult task for someone in my position to, to take on. So we took a look at a couple of agencies, and, and Drug Free Clubs of America or DSCA stood out to us in a positive way on, on a number of levels. So let me dive in. First, I'll give you some background just reading off their one sentence mission from their website. Drug Free Clubs of America is a student-led drug, drug prevention program that gives students an opportunity to earn rewards at school and in the community for being drug free. Now for clarity, what that means is our kids are volunteering to be drug screened in school. Every one of these students has submitted to at least one test this year and they can randomly, test, randomly be tested more frequently than that. So um, that's obviously a very bold direction for us to, to tread forward on as a school district. 
Um, there, there's a couple of really important things that stood out for us and helped us decide to kind of move in that direction. First of all, DSCA is really all about promoting positive things, uh, you know, recognizing these kids for being courageous and kind of publicly leading that drug free lifestyle, um, and just recognizing the good. Um, I think we can all agree as educators and as parents, it's all too common for the kids to make, the kids that make the good decisions tend to be the ones that don't necessarily garner our attention when the kids make bad decisions that, have been, that then tend to garner our attention. So DSA is an organization that helps us as a school disrupt that. We're always looking for that. Anyway, we can recognize your kids for making good decisions. We want to learn more about that. Um, DSA is completely voluntary. Uh, obviously, this isn't something that's for everyone. There, there's kids and families in this community that just don't have a comfort level with that. And that's okay. We get it. Um, we're here when you're ready. Um, no, no, no pressure on that. Um, I like the idea because DSC has a lot of student leadership responsibility baked into it. Um, so one of the things we're excited about, once our testing concludes in March, we are going to be electing DSCA officers, a president, a vice president. That's just going to add to a broader uh, student leadership portfolio that we're proud of here. Um, in my 18 months here, we refreshed the principal, principal's advisory committee. We are entering our second class of students who have taken part in the First Ring Leadership Academy, and now this. We're, we're big believers in our students having a voice and having a sense of governance in our school. Beyond that, I think most importantly for me, DFCA um, treats drug addiction and substance abuse for what it truly is. It is a threat to your child's health. Um, and so when kids test, and if for some reason one of them tests positive, I never find that out. Our school district doesn't find that out. The local police departments don't find that out. That information is treated delicately and shared privately with families, considered a private, a private family matter only. Um, that's incredibly important for my perch because what that does is it allows the family, again, to focus on this for what it is, a threat to your child's health. The reality, I can tell you 20 years as an educator, when students get brought up, you're caught up in this stuff, they start looking at pretty serious school-based consequences and potentially pretty serious legal consequences. And what, from what, you know, what my experience would tell you is that when that happens, parents tend to shift a little bit. They tend to start dedicating a lot of time and energy and resource trying to rescue their kids from some pretty serious consequences, as opposed to focusing that time, energy, and resource around helping them get through that mental health piece. Um, so with that said, sounds great, wonderful, who could argue, right? Um, the reality is, this, again, a big deal for us, bold step for us to take, and endeavors like this don't happen in isolation. I have a lot of people helping out, so I want to start off with some thank yous. Uh, and first and foremost, I want to thank our superintendent, Tom Evans. I want to thank our school board. Um, in September, I presented to the board with this proposal to establish a Drug-Free Clubs of America chapter for our high school and middle school. And it isn't a step a school district takes very easily. It's a pretty bold step. So I want to thank you for kind of being bold and supporting us. You can see by our turnout tonight, a lot of families saw this as a positive step and supported. I'm really, really proud and gratified to see that. Um, thank you. I want to thank Dr. Ted Calaris, our assistant superintendent. Uh, AKA the Grant Whisperers, I like to call them. Um, <laughs> this isn't free. Um, you know, we, we partnered with the families. Families paid a small fee to, to do this. We, we helped we, uh, cover a, a decent part of it ourselves. But when I say we cover a decent part of it ourselves, I really mean Dr. Calaris worked his magic with the grant writing machine. Um, he has an amazing knack. I've never worked with someone more talented in terms of just always being aware of a grant that can help our kids in some area where we, we need help. Um, and so very early on in the planning stages with this, Dr. Clerk is able to kind of settle me down and say, Pat, there's some grant opportunities we can look at here. Let me worry about the money. I'll get that handled. You just worry about planning the important stuff. And sure enough, they didn't back down and came through with some funds that helped us out there. So thank you, Dr. Clerk. Um, Ryan Kelber. Ryan Kelber is our athletic director. He couldn't be here tonight. He is actually out uh, supporting our girls' basketball team as they hopefully take down Dalton, although I understand Dalton would be a pretty formidable opponent. Uh, Grace Lasky is one of our DSC members. She's out playing in that game. Uh, but Ryan has served as our staff coordinator. He's been incredibly valuable to me and kind of my right hand in terms of just helping out with the logistics of the testing, the schedule, the organization. It's, it's quite an endeavor, testing kids on our campus. Um, so Ryan's been doing a lot of work, certain point on that. This has been a passion project for him, and, and we appreciate having his support. Um, next up, though, our Cleveland Clinic folks. So I'm going to ask Meredith Seeley and Amy Buxar to come on up. All right. We've been very blessed. <laughs> Amy, uh, sorry, Meredith is the um, program manager for the community, community relations department at Cleveland Clinic. 
And Amy is our, Amy's our rock star nurse that, uh, you know, the two of these, they have been boots on the ground for us for every test. They've been on our campus helping out. We've been incredibly fortunate. Um, again, when this got approved in September, that turned into a big task for me, finding a health agency that's willing to partner with us on something like this. And when I say partner with us, I mean volunteer a lot of time and capital to come on campus, uh, man hours, while resources, while woman hours, actually, even better, right? Um, but you know, it, it was a big thing, and so um, we, we've absolutely struck gold having these two help us out. They, they're talented, they're fun ladies, um, they're very kid friendly. They, they don't, they're full time jobs not working in schools, but you know, this is kind of an anxiety inducing thing for kids to go through, and just a lot of like high fives and laughs, and just kind of lightening the mood. We, we are just so, so fortunate to have you guys working with us. So I have two things for Amy and Meredith, okay? First, um, on behalf of the Cuyahoga Heights Schools and the Cuyahoga Heights Board of Education, I'll present them with this plaque. I'm gonna read the inscription real quick. Uh, drug Free Club of America chapter at Cuyahoga Heights High School and Middle School has allowed us to facilitate a student-led drug prevention program that positively recognize students who courageously choose to publicly live and lead a drug-free lifestyle. This program would not be possible without the Cleveland Clinic Foundation's generosity. On behalf of the Cuyahoga Heights Schools and the Cuyahoga Heights Board of Education, we wish to formally recognize and thank the Cleveland Clinic Foundation for their support and for their partnership. So thank you so much. Now, and Meredith right on, right on shoes wearing blue. So early on in our partnership, <laughs> I realized their nursing scrubs tend to be blue a lot. They wear a lot of blue, and we don't like blue around. Blue doesn't work so well around here. So we wanted them to have some some kind of heights uh, swag, hopefully that they'll feel comfortable wearing on campus, and we want them kind of proudly sporting our colors and our emblem around their communities as well. So, thank you. Thank Amy, you. that is for you. Awesome. Thank you. Meredith, that is for you. Thank you again. We're, we're hopeful right. to continue working with you guys. Thanks so much. Pleasure. All right. Next up, my kids. Um, you guys are our pioneers, your leaders. I've talked with you individually about this sort of thing at one point or another. Um, you know, I got two quick stories. One, sometime on my first month working here, it was right after the first Sports Hall of Fame, I had the privilege of following around Tom Evans for a campus tour. He was giving the alumni uh, a tour that were in town for the Sports Hall of Fame weekend, and nobody gives a tour of this campus like Mr. Evans. <laughs> nobody. Gives, to, to tell the stories, to the jokes, the, you know, all of it. It's oxygen to him, and let me tell you, he had this group of people eating out of his hand. It was a beautiful thing to watch. And then we turned a corner and we started walking down the main hallway. And then as charming and as engaging as we all know Mr. Evans to be, it ceased to matter. They, they just stopped, they just started trailing off. And it was pretty cool. A lot, of, a lot of folks just stopping and looking at the walls and pointing and laughing and thinking and reflecting and telling stories. And I made a note of it at the time. This is a really, really unique place in that the pictures on the walls in, in, this, in these physical structures mean more than just anywhere else I've been. And, and what we put on the walls matters here. It matters a lot. Um, that's a really, really unique thing, a really, really cool thing, and definitely something we're going to work really hard to continue to nurture. So on that note, to my 32 charter members, um, we're going to find a prominent place for this with all your names. I'll read all your names off in just a second. I'll read the inscription at the top. Drug Free Clubs of America Charter Class 2019-2020. In recognition of our DFCA Charter Class in alignment with Drug Free Club of America's values, these courageous students were the first to make the public choice to live, lead, and promote a drug-free lifestyle. So for the official record, those, those individuals are Dominic Belko, Khalid Boyd, Zach Polaris, Francis Connors, Joseph Connors, Matt Connors, Riley Connors, Casey Conti, Riley Conti, Richard Crane, Nick Dabrowski, April Hedrick, Josh, Jocelyn Kaczynski, Andrew Capus, David Capus, Jade Capus, Savannah Capus. <laughs> Special thanks to the Capus and Connors guys. <laughs> 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 a lot of ways. A couple relay teams on there. A couple relay teams on there. I don't think I didn't notice that. Um, on the sibling front here, Angelina Kondash, Anthony Kondash, 
Grace Lasky, and Grace could be your night she's playing basketball. Andrew McDonald, Jacob Osborne, Savannah Peck, Alice A. Reyes, Frances Francesca Ross, Luciana Ross, Skylar Sane, Ava Schmidt, Alex Trusso, Kayla Valley, Samantha Valley, and Tyler Wheaton. So again, this will go up on the wall in some place probably. We haven't decided yet. Maybe our leadership team can determine that. But I sincerely hope you come back 30 years from now. I don't think Mr. Evans will still be the superintendent. I'm pretty confident he'll still be giving tours at that point. So, 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 I hope you look back in with a lot of pride that you guys were the start. You guys, this wouldn't be here without you. You guys were the initial class. You got this thing rolling. And at that point in time, it almost certainly will have saved some life. Pretty good stuff. Right. One more Last, I'm almost done. Um, see a lot of our kids in these sweatshirts. I got these kids in the last week or so. Kids have taken home these, these sweatshirts. Pretty nice. I, I, I like them. And so. Another quick, I guess, uh, side story. Um, when I, you know, one of my, beyond like things, you know, beyond my, the, the things my family's given me, notes on Mother's, notes on Father's Day for my kids and, you know, wedding ring and all that. Um, aside from that, my most prized possession, my most prized material possession is actually this old bundle of rags right here. Now, I'll tell you why. Um, when I was a freshman at Ohio State University, I was walking around the French Field House and I saw a guy named Jimmy Jackson. Does anyone here anyone remember Jimmy Jackson? Jimmy Jackson at the time was one of the best college basketball players in the country, ended up being drafted by the Dallas Mavericks. He played 14 years in the NBA, on a talent star team, dynamite basketball player. And so I was a little starstruck. But Jimmy was also wearing one of these. And I remember thinking, I've got to get me one of those jackets. Those are awesome. I've got to get one of those. And so, in pretty short order, I realize these jackets are not for sale. You don't you don't buy them. They cannot be bought. They have to be earned. They're, they're, these are Ohio State Lemons jackets. And so I was running track and cross country at the time. And I, my freshman year, I worked really hard. Didn't get my Lemons jacket. I didn't earn it. Sophomore year, worked very hard, ran very well, had some great races. Didn't earn it. My junior year was a good year. My junior year, I had my jacket. And to this day, I look back, it's a symbol to me. I look back on it with a lot of pride. It's important to me. It's a reminder to me how important it is to set goals. It's a reminder to me how hard it is to work hard and be passionate about things. And it's a reminder to me that, again, the most important things in life are things you cannot purchase. They are things you have to go out and earn. So they're not Letterman's jackets, but those, there's only 32 of those. Okay, I don't have one. Dr. Claris won't have one. Mr. Evans won't have one. You had to earn one of those by being one of our charter members. Not, we're not going to be giving them out to successive classes. So when I see you in the hallways wearing those, know that I'm looking at you as a leader and as a pioneer. And I thank you. Thanks for being part of it. Thank you for being part of something, again, that could potentially help save lives. So before I get any more sappy, I'm going to stop and let uh, Mrs. Houchin handle elementary students of the month. And I'll come back up and we'll do the, uh, do the middle school high school students of the month. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Ask the DFCA kids to stay and we're going to take yeah. the picture. Sorry, DFCA guys, if you guys would stay a few minutes, we do want to get pictures in just a couple minutes. So sorry. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's really, really awesome. And I love seeing so many of you that I know who have now grown taller than me. <laughs> red shirts. That's pretty awesome. Super proud of you. So we're going to start tonight with elementary so that Mr. Coleman can have a little break. Um, and then we'll move on to the middle and high school students of the month. But this month, we have the pleasure of introducing two first graders from the elementary school. First, we will start with Lincoln Candow. Come on up, Lincoln. Stand here by me. Look at everybody out there. Take a look at the board. Look at this. <laughs> yes. Lincoln, I love, I love seeing Lincoln's smile on face at school. So Lincoln is in first grade. He is seven years old. And he is in his class. This is Harvin's class. This is Harvin's class. Lincoln comes to us from Valley View, where he lives with his parents, Leanne and Steve. His sister, Lydia, who's in kindergarten. She's back there. Hi, Lydia. And Nora, who's two, two, right? Yeah. Home with Grandma. Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> um, 
When I asked Lincoln what his favorite subject was at school, he said math. And why? Because it's fun. That's why. I asked him what his favorite special was, and he said technology because he gets to play games and technology on the computer. Um, when I asked him what he likes to do outside of school, he said play pretend football at my house. So we were trying to figure out what pretend football looks like. It's football, it's just not on the big field. Um, he likes to play basketball and soccer, flag football, and he is in coach pitch as well. When he grows up, Lincoln would like to be a builder. And I asked him what he wanted to build, and he said big towers. So I asked him why, he said because I like to build, and we talked about building my dream house for me. So <laughs> someday we'll get that. It's probably going to be in Florida, though. It's probably Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fly again. All right, we built my house. All right. Um, to Mrs. Harbin, he said, you are a great teacher. And to his parents, he said, I love you, Mom and Dad. And this is what his teachers had to say about him. Lincoln came out as our nomination for first grade student of the month. We appreciate Lincoln's motivation and hardworking attitude. He gets to his tasks right away, <laughs> focuses on his work, and then completes his work in a timely manner. His motivation is apparent as he is determined not only to master his first grade addition and subtraction math facts, but also facts he'll be practicing in second grade. He has a joy of learning something new. When presented with writing in a new way, Lincoln doesn't just write one book, but many books in the new style. Each book is better than the one before as Lincoln listens to direction and criticism to get better. There are a lot of adults who can't do yeah. Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln is a kind boy who treats all students and teachers with kindness and respect. One of the best things about Lincoln is his ability to be a good friend to all. He is always first to help someone, whether it's other students or the teacher. He's always willing to partner up with those who need someone to listen to them or work with them. He sets a good example for all on how to be kind and respectful. And that's from Mrs. Bazizzo, Mrs. Harvin, and Mrs. Casper. Congratulations. Thank you. Can I have here with me for a few minutes? Okay. okay. All right, we're going to call up Madison Hawthorne. Come on up, Madison. <laughs> <laughs> Show them your smiling face, too. <laughs> 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 this is like the best part of my job, seeing these smiling faces. Madison is in first grade. She is not seven yet. She informed me she is six and a half. <laughs> she lives in Valley View with her parents, Tracy and Andy, and her sister, Ava, who's in pre K, who's back there too, and her cat, me. I asked her, What is your favorite thing about school? and she said, Lunch. Yes. <laughs> and I said, Why lunch? She said, Because I'm always thirsty by the time it's time to go to lunch. So that is a very good reason. And Madison said her favorite special is the library because she loves to get funny books like elephant and piggy books. And she loves art because she loves to draw. When I asked her what she likes to do outside of school, she said play Frozen and play in the snow. So you're going to get a chance to do that <laughs> over like the tomorrow. next few days. Uh, she loves to be in gymnastics, soccer, t-ball, and this is my favorite, she is in curling. Oh, I've never had someone say they were in curling before. That's pretty awesome. When she grows up, she wants to be an art teacher. And I asked her if she wanted to teach big kids or little kids, and she said, how about both? Because she just loves to draw. She said to Mrs. Bazidlo, you are a great teacher. And to her parents, I love you. Madison shows she is caring by how she treats her classmates and teachers. She is always <coughs> respectful to adults and ready to help her peers. Madison is honest. She can always be trusted to behave even when the teacher is not watching. She sets a wonderful example for her peers of mature behavior. Madison is often recognized by teachers outside of the first grade team for her good behavior and level of engagement. Reminders are never needed to start her work or follow directions. Listening and following directions are strengths which help Madison stay safe and be a good role model for others. In addition to exemplifying our CHDS motto, Madison also has a strong work ethic. She stays on task 
and often goes above and beyond. These are qualities that will take Madison far in life. And I have to just tell one little extra story. We had a day where we had a student in Madison's class who was struggling with it. He was having a really bad day. And he was crying next to his mom. And we were trying to get the student to go back to class. And Madison got up and walked over and said, I need a partner. Can you come help me? She saw that he needed someone to reach out, and she did it. So these are excellent examples of caring, honest, engaged, and safe students. And we want to congratulate you both for being such great students. Thank you. Okay, me again. Okay, we're starting off with our sixth grade student of the month for the month of February. That is Anna Rikowski. Come on up, Anna. Okay. And uh, Anna and I sat down recently and had a conversation. I learned lots of things. Uh, first of all, uh, mom is married, dad is parents. Uh, Anna comes to us from the village of Valley View. She has several siblings. Uh, Josephine is a fourth grader at Cuyahoga Heights Elementary School, and some older siblings, Todd, Jessica, and Melissa. Then I dove into the important stuff. I asked Anna about her future plans. I always love asking sixth graders this question. Future plans? What? What do you want to happen, Anna? <laughs> what do you want to do? Uh, she started with, I have no idea. And of course, we kind of pressed a little bit. And it's interesting, sometimes when the students say they have no idea when you press, they actually just drop a pearl of gold, a pot of gold right in front of you. She said, well, actually, if I think about it, I really like the idea of working for Disney, specifically working as part of their movie production team, like editing, sound, back end stuff. And you go, whoa, that's, that's awesome. We can work with that. Um, I asked Anna about her favorite subject. She said math. And I asked her why. She said, it's just easy for me. Um, I asked her about her favorite, most memorable teacher. She said, I really like Miss Boswell at the elementary school. She did really fun activities like the wax museum. We had a really fun experiment with pumpkins where we rolled them down the hallways. And it actually reminded me of some fraternity days. <laughs> 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 we lots of posters. We made t-shirts. <coughs> um, yeah, good, good stuff there. And then lastly, I asked Hannah about a role model. And for her role model, she said, my dance teacher. I asked her to speak a little more about that. She said she inspires me to work hard, not only on dance, but she inspires me to work hard at everything I do. So again, congratulations, Anna. Keep up the great work. Our February student. Honor. <laughs> Next up, February student of the month for the seventh grade is Lorenzo Amato. Come on up, Lorenzo. Okay. And again, our conversation, my conversation with Lorenzo yielded the following information. He's from he's coming to us from Garfield Heights. Uh, he started with me. He started uh, August of last year, right? Mm. August 2018. Good stuff. We're part of the same recruiting class. Right? <laughs> All, right. All right. Good stuff. Um, Bombs deny. That is August. Uh, one sibling, Giada Sophia Amato. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Good. Tough one. Um, future plans. Lorenzo said he wants to be an animator one day. Is really interested in making art. He likes the idea of making art for other people. Uh, I asked him what type of animation. He said, well, computer-based animation, traditional animation, uh, whether it's static pieces of artwork, I want to try it all. And then I'm confident once I've tried it all, I'll find something I love, and then I will stick with that, which is a very, very good plan. Good stuff there. Asked him about his favorite subject. Oddly enough, it was art class. Uh, asked him to talk more about that. He said, this is what I want to do. Um, I asked him about his favorite teacher, and he says, favorite teacher is Mrs. Russell, mostly because she's my homeroom teacher and I see her the most. So frequency is important. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, I asked him uh, about his role model. And he said, my role model is my parents. Um, even if they struggle, they get back up and they deal with it. They are really kind people, which inspires me. I hope to live up to that and be as kind as possible as well. Really good mm -hmm. stuff. Lorenzo. Eighth grade student of the month. We already recognized her as one of our 32 charter members of our DFCA uh, uh, group. Uh, but Angelina Kondash 
eighth grade student of the month for the month of February. She wants to go to medical school and become a doctor and kind of repay that. She's going to be the first doctor in her family. I think that's amazing. Good stuff. Congratulations. <laughs> Senior and his locker, his locker is right around the corner from my office, class of 2020. Uh, and Daniel, who graduated class of 2016. Um, I asked Jacob about his future plans. Again, he started off with, I don't really know. But he did say he wanted to be a baseball player. I asked, we talked a little bit about that, asked him about position. He said he really likes the idea of playing center field. Um, but with that said, if that doesn't work out, he then explained that he wants to be a field level biologist one day. So again, started off with an I don't know, and then a great answer comes out. That's a good stuff. Um, favorite subject, he says honors biology. It's a really challenging course, uh, but it has helped me improve my study habits, and now I feel much more confident retaining and recalling the information. If I think about it, this has helped me in every one of my classes. Asked him about his favorite teacher, and he explained Mrs. Kropchak, who was on his biology teacher, correct? Um, he said, everything in, the, in her class is very straightforward. It's very easy to comprehend. Uh, she doesn't give us a lot of work, but the work that she does give us is for a purpose, and it really helps us understand things. And then lastly, I asked Jacob about a role model, and he mentioned our baseball coach, Coach Solomon. Um, he said, I really look up to him. Uh, his attitude is always really positive. He's a really good person. Uh, he's concerned about helping us become better people. Uh, as much as better baseball players. I really like the atmosphere he creates around our team. It's very, very positive. Okay, good stuff. Congratulations, Jacob. <laughs> Alex Crocker. Alex warned me she had a conflict, so she might not be here. Did Alex make it? Okay. All right. We'll do embarrass Alex in school later. All right. Next up, our 11th grade student of the month for the month of February is Kenny Wojtek. Kenny, come on. <laughs> Okay, um, Katie comes to us from the village of Valley View. Um, Mom is Rebecca. Yeah, she's all sorry. Um, siblings: Mara, class of 2019, uh, and Macy, who's currently a ninth grader, class of 2023. Um, I asked Kenny about future plans, and she was pretty quick. No hesitation. She mentioned physical therapy. Um, I asked her why. She said first. I just, I just think the anatomy piece is a really interesting thing. I like understanding how and why the body moves the way it does, uh, but also I really like the idea of helping people and helping people recover and rehab from, from injuries, so, so great reasons there. Um, I asked her about her favorite subject, and Becky, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not anatomy. Right. 
math. It's math. Um, again, she said it just comes very easy to me. I really enjoy math. Um, but I did ask her about her role models, and she said, my role models are my mom and dad. They have been such a great help. Uh, they help me. They have helped me so much in accomplishing all that I have. They are extremely successful themselves, and I want to live up to that. Okay, congratulations. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Last and not least, our senior 12th grader, Kyle Pollock, 12th grade student of the month. <laughs> All right, Kyle and I had a great conversation. So you get a little more, little more run here. Um, so uh, Kyle is coming to us from the village of Valley View. Uh, Mom is Paula, Dad is John. Um, Kyle has uh, two siblings, uh, Nathan, who I just missed, class of 2018, but he's at Ohio State, so I like him already. Um, and Riley, who's an eighth grader here at Kyle Banks Middle School. In terms of future plans, uh, Kyle is planning that he's planning right now on attending Bowling Green State University. And he's thinking about focusing on teaching and coaching. So maybe we can recruit Kyle back this way down the road and see. Um, I asked him a little bit more what kind of, so I'm already starting with the recruitment, what subject matter, what kind of are you pursuing, grade level, all that. Um, and he said, I want to stay away from middle school age. He, said, I um, he did say, I really like the idea of working with high school students. I like the maturity there and the types of relationships you can build. Uh, but he also says he really likes the idea of working with young kids in elementary and kind of the impact you can have at that level. He also loves the idea of coaching one day, um, whether it's football, basketball, or track. All right, good stuff. Uh, and Kyle was trying track this year for, for, for the first time since middle school, right? Before yeah. a baseball player. But if you see number 20 dart around on the football field, it's been kind of a crime here. The track track really like the public thing. Good stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing him out there. Um, I asked him about his favorite subject. We actually talked quite a bit about this. He mentioned AP research. He said, the capstone program has been absolutely amazing for me. Uh, and real quick, the capstone program is really composed of two courses. We recently became uh, a capstone school district. Uh, to earn a capstone diploma, the AP capstone diploma, you need to take AP seminars, of course, and AP research. Uh, you also need to earn a three or higher on three other AP tests, and then you earn a capstone diploma. There are only 40 high schools in the state of Ohio currently that offer this program. And so we're really proud of the programming and, and it's really excited to hear some things that Kyle had to say about it. So the capstone program has been absolutely amazing for me. Prior to this class, I've never taken an AP course, yet I have learned so much. Everything from how to properly format a paper for college level coursework, how to flow everything together in terms of making a well-formed argument, no matter what I am reviewing or analyzing, I've learned how to look at a problem through different angles or perspectives, and what I found is that's a critical piece to becoming a great, great problem solver. Now that's kind of cool for yourself, so that's, I mean, that's good stuff, it's impressive. Um, I asked about what they're doing right now in class. I said, right now I'm using the AP research course to analyze the Lake Erie watershed and how it impacts Lake Erie water quality. As a tangible example, Next week, my chemistry teacher and I will be collecting samples and analyzing the relative water quality at different points in our watershed. It has been absolutely fascinating to study. It affects everything. It affects our environment. It affects the, the fish inside. It affects wildlife. It affects our personal health. Um, in short, I absolutely love the class. Uh, so good stuff. Quite a testimony for AP Research. And AP Seminar and AP Research are open to anyone who wants to take it if they can fit it into your schedule. So please, consider consider these courses, parents, as your kids are talking about their respective schedules. Um, I asked Kyle about his favorite teacher, and he cited one of our custodians. Firstly, he asked, he said, can I talk about someone other than one of my teachers? I said, absolutely. So he cited Mr. Gibson, who's one of our custodians, and actually used to be Kyle's bus driver for, for quite a while. Uh, he stated that Mr. Gibson, I've known him for over five years. Uh, he's always positive, he's always there. He's at all our football games, he's always supporting us. Every time I see him, he stops me, he checks in on how I'm doing, and he wishes me well. He's a very, very positive person. And then lastly, uh, his role model. For his role model, he mentioned his older brother, Nathan. He said, Nathan is a very smart guy. School came very easily to him. He said, sometimes I think it comes a little harder to me, but I've always aspired to, to follow his footsteps. Even though he's in college, we stay in touch with each other quite a bit. I really appreciate getting his perspective on things. I, I try to check with him on all the important stuff I'm thinking about, sometimes even before my parents. Good stuff there. All right, last thing I'm going to read uh, what his teacher had to say about it briefly. Um, this is from Megan Neville, who nominated him. He said, Kyle is exactly the kind of student I love to know as a person. He's curious, he's honest, and he's engaged. He's willing to take healthy risks for the sake of learning new things. 
For instance, he rolled AP seminar last year after never even having taken an honors course before and then continued on this year as one of only two pioneers in AP research. He's not afraid of a challenge and he understands that sometimes having a demanding or difficult learning experience will pay off in the end, even if he didn't get an A. Outside of school, he manages to do important volunteer work. Camp Powell's, Jacob Ladder, et cetera, despite, excuse me, despite participating in sports, having a job, and completing schoolwork readily, uh, reliably, Kyle is a great asset to CHS and all he does for his peers and teachers. I'm very confident it's a bright future. Kyle is one of the seniors we're definitely going to miss. Thank you so much. So at this point of the meeting, I want to thank Mr. Callender for his patience and then <laughs> we appreciate him being here. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Muccio. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, President Dobbins. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce everybody uh, here at the board meeting to uh, Mr. Ryan Callender, who's a partner with Squire Patton Barnes. Um, we uh, we kind of touched base on um, Ryan at our previous board meeting a little bit. Um, but just to give some background before you know passing the mic off to Ryan, um, you know we would um, look to add Ryan um, to our team as levy legal counsel to assist us with um, any upcoming potential levy that we would have for the district. So um, we're just kind of laying the groundwork for you know any you know team members that we would want to bring in to help us work if we're going down the path for a levy, whether it's bond, permanent improvements or operating. Um, Ryan, in essence, in, at least the way I look at it, would be um, our primary legal counsel dealing with levies um, with Enos Britton, which is our general school district um, legal counsel, kind of in a secondary capacity at this point in time. Um, I anticipate the cost for Ryan's services would be a blanket purchase order not to exceed 4500 for the uh, totality of what we're thinking. And I'm just anticipating that um, we would use Ryan as a team member for drafting the ballot language, um, general levy guidance, assistance with calculating the amount of the levy, any potential levy, and possible board and or finance committee presentations if it works. Um, and then uh, I'll pass the mic up to Ryan to maybe you know introduce himself, explain more of his background. And... Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks again. My name is Ryan Callender, I'm partner with Clark Pettenbaum. Um, I have, for about 20 years, practiced on the which is most of my clients that don't know what we um, that um, delays are either revenues or, or debt and bond. Um, I've represented school districts for, for most of those uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, our practice in Square Pet and Bonds represents uh, numerous school districts all over the state, but uh, the Northeast Ohio in that. Over the last, say, 10 to 15 years, the choices of levies and the different types of levies uh, that, that school districts may look at has expanded greatly. One may say they've evolved, another person may say they've evolved, but <laughs> we have a lot more choice. <laughs> so that's, we deal with that day in and day out, um, and that certainly uh, is an act um, all and certainly why we can uh, go to have um, it's not just, you know, I would certainly be your main point of contact, but we have, uh, in the prison alone, about, um, about 14 uh, public finance attorneys that are available uh, to you as well. Um, the nice thing about that is we do a lot of what we refer to as home research because I don't represent all the school districts that Squire does, but everyone in my online floor does. And so it's always um, has been beneficial for our clients to be able to walk in and say, well, what's so and so do you want to and what's so and so do Hopefully, give you the benefit of that. Be happy to answer any questions. So take us through the process sure. of sit down and we start to decide. <coughs> We need a levy because we want to do some capital improvements and we want to stay um, in the plus side by operating. Yeah. So take us through the process of what you would do. Yeah, so um, a great question. Um, what we do is sit down and actually already build a little bit of preview to that with uh, your superintendent and treasurer. Sit down and say, what do you need? And the identification right now for these two, would you like a little bit for capital and a little bit for operating? Um, at 
that point, you have to share your different choices, for example, including the ballot. A lot of times, the ballot might be the deciding factor in the votes, or the power votes on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And all the ballot when you need to decide whether or not you're going to vote, so you don't have much choice. <laughs> Um, at that point, you would decide to go in a, in a particular direction. Then the real procedure kind of picks up. You decide how much, uh, what dollar amount you're really really looking for. They help you um, interface with the county district office in order to determine what that dollar amount is. Um, the ballot is likely, I'm assuming you're not taking an emergency budget, the dollar um, All other levies. Uh, so we help you determine that amount. And then we'd start into the procedure of actually putting on the ballot. It's a two resolution process. Um, first resolution, actually getting the county fiscal officer to certify the dollar amounts, usually is the word that I'm supposed to be looking for. But of course, we're going to do that pre, so we know that's not going to be a surprise. Mm -hmm. And then the second resolution is the resolution of actually placing it on the ballot. So we would provide those resolutions. Provide that guidance, and with that second the second resolution comes uh, about half a dozen other documents um, that Matt would then present to uh, the board of elections. So the proposed ballot language you, the school district, always want to be um, ideally in control of that and making sure that you're dotting the dotting your eyes and crossing your T's and making sure that the correct ballot language is providing that to the board. Really like a way of doing that. Um, you know, we're getting additional seats from the Board of Elections, we're getting a ballot on a certain part of the deadline of the Board of Elections is not going to come back out. Um, also, providing the Board of Elections with the notice that is required. The Board of Elections is required to give notice of their credentials when it's done. So many days ahead of election, we'd actually provide that as well, again, mm -hmm. making sure that it's correct. Set up, but you want to make sure that uh, you know, the, the worst thing in the world for the Board of Education is to go through the process that you never need to put a new letter in the ballot and to have something procedurally having gone wrong. And they don't find that out until it's too late. So that we really help uh, making sure that all of the uh, roadmaps you're taking the right. Sounds good. Certainly. Good. Any other questions? And you're saying that you 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 would be the point person, but there'd be other people from your organization that would be also involved with this, if if necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, the you had just pulled off. I think I think it was I don't know if it was it, but pulled off um, some ballot language from other local school districts and saying, "Well, I kind of this is kind of interesting." This yeah. That happened to be our attorney who did that too. So <laughs> that can, I, I can easily go to that attorney and say, well, how do, how do we make that ballot language look like that and still so take it? So again, I would do most of the work, but we've got that kind of deep branch bond um, that is always there. And, and I think the, the pinnacle question is going to be the amount. Sure. So that's. Yeah. Something that you would work with us and calculate? We'll certainly help you calculate what millage equals what amount, and vice versa. Yeah, it's the, the, what the number is going to come from us, and what, what yeah. he will do will then verify what that looks like in the term of millage and what that's going to generate. And I, and I think Matt maybe put it best as, as we, uh, as we, we started through this process is that we're, we're kind of assembling a team of people that, that have certain levels of expertise in different areas, and certainly uh, the the ballot language and the legal aspect part of it. Mr. Callender brings a great deal of strength and a lot of resources to the table. You, you heard Galen a couple of weeks ago, and we and we met with Galen this week, um, and she she brings a certain amount of expertise on on ballot issues, the actual working with it, getting the passage of that. Aaron brings a certain level of expertise in the public. So. We're, we're kind of putting together this team, so we, we're, as you very appropriately said, so we dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's as we go through this process. And, we, we, you know, we're hopeful that this is a one-time process that we don't have to repeat for several years. And 
one of the reasons that we're putting a team together is that we're not on the ballot every two years. And this is not something that uh, neither Matt or I have a high level of expertise with because we don't do it that often here. Mm -hmm. So we want to make right. sure that when we do it, we do it right. And, uh, um, and we put the things in place that you as a board want to see in place. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned teams, and I assume I, that's the first I've heard of the name Dan and Sean. Yeah. But I work with Dan. I have no idea who you're talking about Dan. I worked with her many times. And in fact, hired her for my own uh, community college for our own. Hmm. So very familiar with the folks. That's good. Good I just wanted to add a couple things. Um, <clears throat> placing a levy on the ballot for the Board of Education, at least in my you know, view, is one of the most important tasks of the Board of Education. So we want to assemble that team with the proper expertise uh, just to provide that you know, clear guidance that you know, we're you know, going in the correct direction. And everything we're looking at is checking out as you know, true and accurate as we go. Um, we're not talking about a you know, tremendously high uh, costs that's associated with this, but at the same time, it's important enough that you know we got to take a look at that too. And also, Ryan has uh, Square Patent Box has ties to uh, this neighborhood uh, with the treatment plant that's across the way. Um, <laughs> that Square Patent Box worked with uh, Bonds, I believe, from. I, I'm actually the Bonds Council. Yeah. 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 We're excited to add Ryan to be a member of our team. Okay. Very honored especially after that. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for the information. We look forward to look, working with you soon that the board is of the same same mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Well, Mr. Lucho, you're on a roll. Um, Treasurer's business is up next, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> go to uh, the first item that we have tonight will be 5A. And this is a motion to approve the minutes of the January 22nd, 2020 regular meeting and the February 12th, 2020 regular meeting as found in attachment C1. I have to apologize. I didn't actually have the opportunity to print this out as I normally do uh, because we lost internet today mm -hmm. at the whole district. So um, it's amazing, you know, once you lose access to the internet, what you can't do, you know, with that, and you have to fall back to the, you know, contingencies that you have. Um, the next items for recommendation tonight, item 6A, um, it's going to be a motion to accept the bank reconciliation, financial reports, and payments for board review as of January 31st, 2020, as prepared and certified by the treasurer as accurate, as found in attachment T2. 6B, motion to approve new vendors to the school district for w 9s as attached as found in attachment T3. 6C, motion to accept the attached list of donations received through January 31st, 2020, as found in attachment T4. And 6D, motion to approve purchase orders over 5,000 as found in attachment T5. And I would ask for motions 5A, 6A through 6D. Is that a consent? Is that would that yes. be a treasurer's yes. consent agenda? Okay, yes. uh, so moved. Second. Okay, the motion's been seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Yeah, just uh, wanted to touch base on a couple of these. Um, as far as 6A, the uh, financial reports, um, we're on track. I won't go into it too much. The prior meeting, we really went in depth on all of our um, different accounts that we have, especially for the general fund. Um, all I'll say is um, we're on track for our five year forecast and our plan going forward. So good news. Um, 6B, we just have one W-9 vendor for approval. It's a small amount that would be taken from the general fund. Uh, 6C would be the donations received. And I just want to thank uh, the Schuchert family, Christopher and Melinda. I'm just putting money in my brother's scholarship. So <laughs> scholarship donation. I, I've got a, another check to write to you soon too. So. And um, right. six D would be the uh, one purchase order that we have, and it's for six thousand three hundred seventy-six dollars and fifty cents. Uh, this is two Heinemann publishers for fourth grade reading reading resources. Good. Um, would you call the roll then? If there's no further discussion, Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Mrs. Schubert. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mr. Naaman. Aye. 
The motion passes 5 0. Okay. And then um, just had two items for discussion tonight. Uh, first, I just wanted to update where we stand with our state software redesign, financial software migration, the update. Um, so we're switching from our current state software to the state software redesign. Um, we've completed the uh, cleanup sheet, I guess you can say, from Neonet. So what we wanted to do essentially was clean up items that were sitting in our current state software as we look to take all of that data that's in our current state software over to the redesign that we have. So we're cleaning up some aspects, the USAS side, the USPS, the payroll side that we have. Um, we've completed that as of the 14th. So now we're in the mode of Neonets reviewing all the data that's currently sitting in our state software. And we're working with them <clears throat> as we go back and forth. Um, and then the next step is gonna be to build that template of what would be our redesigned software as we go to it. So we're starting to you know, make sure all of our data is correct. We have to migrate everything in that data over to the new state software redesign. So we're taking everybody's payroll information, all the deductions, the job screens, the vendors, the checks that we've cut this year, the checks that we've cut previous years that we have. So it's a lot of data that we're taking from that current software and migrating it over to the redesign. So it's a lot of checks and balances, making sure everything matches up, making sure if we're moving, you know, my payroll information is going to the correct, you know, um, Matt Mucha that would be in the redesign software. So um, that, at least in my my eyes, is going to be the biggest task that we have is just making sure, you know, all the, the data that we're taking over um, is going to line up. And then once we start doing that and we feel, you know, as we start going through that redesign software, um, we're checking it with Neonet or ITC um, and it looks correct. We're going to balance those two systems. So we're essentially going to work at both for a short time. Um, and then once we feel confident enough in that redesign software, we let the old software fall away and we're just using that new software that we have going forward. So, but we want to, you know, use both enough that, you know, if something goes wrong with the new software, we can still fall back, uh, fall back on the redesign software or the state software that we have, um, just to keep everything still everything that we have in the district. And I just want to thank, um, uh, the treasurer's office, Kathy and Yelixa, they've been doing a tremendous amount of work uh, with this behind the scenes. And I just want to publicly thank them for all that hard work. Is it positive? Like, are they feeling confident too? Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. But it's, uh, they feel positive. They're excited about it as much as you can be for accounting software. So, yeah, I'll say that. It's, uh, it's not like you're going to the world sponsor or something like that, which would be a lot more exciting. But, you know, Joe and Mark are excited. Uh, I don't know. Like, in the context of the Stones are 11 years old, I think I take the accounting software for all years. In the context of you know, accounting, so financial software, we're, we're pretty excited too. And our hope is that we transition over and nobody else really notices anything. I mean, that's the perfect scenario. So, I was going to ask you, what do you think your timetable will be like? You know you're going to do the two systems, right. and then we're hoping when are you going to make the big jump? Right. We're hoping ultimately by summer that we okay. have everything complete. Sounds so, like um, you know, certainly by the start of next school year, we're looking to kick off with that new redesign software that will be Sounds on. Like a good mm -hmm. So are you expecting to actually close the June 30 books with the current both. software or the new software? Or do it both? Both. Oh, great. So we're going to help the auditors. When I told them that we're thinking about closing with both um, the redesign, if we if we get to that point, sure. but certainly with the state software, uh, I think Matt Goldman had a big smile on his face um, <laughs> because for the auditors too, they have to learn this redesign system. So it's a lot of work with them. You know, they can't take the same reports that you know we that have been using for the past 40, 50 years on the uh, state software, the fin sums, the rep leads, the bud leads. Um, you know, as you go through your budgetary, you look at that. So it's a lot of different, you know, they're not, the state's not renaming all those reports the same name. I'm not sure why, I think that would make sense, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so there are some differences there that, you know, the auditors are learning too, but um, yeah, the, the goal would be that we would close with both softwares. Um, and then, you know, certainly at the start of next school year, you know, we're using the, um, the new software, but, you know, we'll update the board as we go. Um, every step of the way, but this initial kickoff cleanup item list that uh, we had completed by the 14th is where we're at, and now we're looking to you know start building what that you know redesign software would look like for Cuyahoga High Schools. So all the things that we did to expedite the auditor's time here, now they're they're learning the software too, so they're going to have to. <laughs> not only are we learning the software, they're going to learn how to use the new software for the auditing purposes. So. <laughs> one, one quick question too. Yeah. So are we migrating all the history? 
or, or is it are you archiving part of that too or is it all coming over or part of it or? we have um yeah we have all of well we have our history archive on what's called the cd-rom yep. from neonet and that goes back up until i want to say the year 2000. Okay. um and we have to see how you know how large that template is from Neonet and how many years of past history we can put in there. So if we're running like a check register report or a Bud Lead report of expenses, you know, how far back can we go? You know, ten years, seven years, fifteen years to mm -hmm. pull that data. Um, it's working with Neonet to see how how much data is you know possible for us to put into that. This, so that goes back twenty years then. So if like we ever needed to recover anything, which I. I don't know if you have to. That's a, you have to right. file. That's <laughs> we we will always have that data. It's okay. just, you know, are we putting it into that redesign as well? But it's always yeah. going to stay on that CD-ROM. Okay. So it's always going to be housed at Neonet, essentially in the cloud on the CD-ROM. So oh, that's never going to leave. We're always going to have the data. It's just, are we going to put how much of that data are we going to put in the redesign? So when, when yeah. we're running reports, it's easier for us to. Uh, I want to see, you know, from current date to 10 years, you know, all expenses from the three fund that we have in the special yeah. cost center. Um, you know, if we can only put seven years or 10 years, you know, that's the limit that I can mm -hmm. go back. Maybe Neonet you know, has enough space for us to put, um, you know, enough. And, you know, it's just generating those current reports with past history. Okay. But the past history is always going to be there. Like we can always. So is, you, is it just the it. data that sits at Neonet or is it basically like, is it, is it basically fully operable at Neonet that we can just pull it back over from like 2000? Or, or like, how does it sit? Like, I just, I'm just curious. You know, yeah. Because like, like, if you, if you had a recovery, like we had a pull something from 2005, like how do we do that? I mean, or, or is the, I mean, I don't, it's probably the risk is probably nil, but I mean, I don't know how, why we would ever want to do that, but you know, I just was curious. Oh yeah. Um, it could be something where I could see about maybe, you know, speaking with Dave Wallace more or even Neonet to have them even come out here and maybe give a very small presentation just on um, kind of, you know, that, retrieval of the data that they have and just mm -hmm. how ready it is because i'm not quite sure you know all the aspects to it you know if yeah. um you know how many different templates of you know our system that they have just sitting there yeah. so you know I, I know that there's a couple and that they can recreate you know our data right away so if we it's kind of like saving a video game in time i guess yeah. you can say mm -hmm. so you know if we're playing you know video game and you start and you save it after a certain point and you keep going um and you can always restart from that point in time i see so, okay so yeah, that 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 would be because what, what would be the reason why we would actually even have to do like recover a closed set of books? Oh, there there are I mean, a couple times, especially when you close a uh, fiscal year end. So okay. they have it where, um, you know, if you ever, for whatever reason, enter some budgetary numbers wrong, you can go back and mm -hmm. you know pull up that yeah, previous that month. Um, yeah, that happens. Um, you know, if but I'm talking 20, from like 15 yeah, from, years prior, like I could see the last. Yeah, the last years. couple. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Sure, that's why I'm not too sure about you know five, ten years down the road. If you want to go and recreate from that point in time, it, it's relatively easy to do now yeah. from the past you know month or two months. You know, they can recreate that template. But is there how any, far back in time we can go to recreate that point in time? I'm not too sure. Is there any sort of like state requirement that lets us? I mean, actually, the other question is, is that do we pay for the archiving of that data? Yes. That's yeah. rolled. That's rolled okay. into the total sum that we. Okay. Pay. So then my question is, is, like, do we? Is it a state requirement that we would actually have so many years worth, or can we eliminate that and actually reduce the? We cost? have like a retention policy that we have Correct. to follow. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And it's nice to go back and look at you know, <coughs> you know, fifteen twenty years ago. So yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. I mean, I was talking to, to Tom the other day about a 30 year you know issue ago that we had. So okay. just retrieving that data and looking, it's you know. It's, it's on the same line as being exciting with you know accounting mm -hmm. financial software. If you go back yeah. in the twenty, like, I'm, I'm excited. I, I, <laughs> well, I ran down this. I was excited. Yeah. So, Talking to Tom's like, like, like <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so, <basically, all> right. <laughs> One last question, and I'll stop. So, like, uh, so like the, um, are you happy with all the controls that are in place? Then? Like, can you can you like post the like closed periods and everything too? Like, yeah, yeah. is it closed out and locked down? Cool. You know, is there is there controls over like approvals and of journal entries and those right. types of things. I haven't played enough with the new state software redesign um, yeah. to get a comfort level okay. um, about it yet. I do know that, and I, when we had Lisa and Kim, when they did the presentation from Neonet, and we talked about the state software redesign as well as eFinance plus those two systems. Um, you know, one aspect I didn't like from both uh, were the facts that uh, you can't you know, close a, a month and move forward and that month is closed and locked down. Yeah. That's something I'm not, 
But yeah. that's, I mean, that's both yeah. sides, you know, yeah. conforming and making the data, you know, open in essence. Okay. So, you know, that's something new that I'm not, you know, tremendously familiar with. Um, mm. But that's, you know, the, the creating of the state software has been run through, uh, you know, a task yeah. uh, group that they have set in place. So it's it's been, you know, there's multiple progressions and I've been looking at it and you know, the state's been involved. So they constructed it to, you know, they're fully aware of what's in it. So yeah, and so it, I like how you can close in a month's lockdown. You can't yeah, that's us. That's why I like that one. So like, because was an, I don't, and this is probably don't even know this right now, but is there? I don't. We have to probably like assess it as it goes on. Because like I would think that you'd want to look and see like how much work will it be to put in manual type of controls when they're not automated like that. You know, like is, is that going to take an, a big effort to do? Because I would imagine that I know that you're and with. I mean, and you've got things controlled. I mean, so it's like, I mean, is that going to take time to, to rebuild and do some of the controls that you currently have in place from the new system, you know, and add up to the new system from what you have right now? Yeah, we, um, not too many controls in the redesign software that we really have to go back and recreate. You know, a lot of our controls sit in our um, requisition software that we have, okay. um, a C view that we use. Um, you know, our, our bank accounts are separate from there that we have with Huntington Bank. And we have a two-person two process to approve uh, payroll or any ACHs that go out. Mm -hmm. um, not too many controls in place. We have our um, listing of users for the ability to go in the system. Um, you know, we have a handful of people that really use it. Um, EMIS, you know, Sandy is going to be one of those people. Um, Treasurer's Office, other people that we would have. So, but not too many people. Um, is, but also, too, with their usernames, um, their different aspects that they can um, go in and look at um, are controlled as well. So um, I'll use Sandy as an example. She can't go in and you know deal with the budgetary information that we have in there. So okay. she's uh, only able to see certain emis portions in that data okay. that revolve around her job duties that she would have. So it's all access role yes. based? Yes, okay. access based. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, Got it. All right. Thank Definitely. you. Going back to uh, Mr. Naiman's original comment about how far back you can go after you've converted. I mean, having the data is one thing. Having something that can read the data and Correct. format it the way you want it is something completely different. Yes. So you may have 20 years worth of data, but you might, if you don't convert it all to the new format, you're only going to be able to look at whatever. It will eliminate the old it. format. It'll, it'll, it'll essentially save it on the old format. So while the old, old format is obsolete and not in use anymore, yeah. you're, <clears throat> when you pull it up, you're still going to be able to read it in that format. Mm -hmm. So in the old format, in the, that's, my the program be that's my, that's my up. understanding of the way that it'll be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And again, once we start jumping in, it doesn't go away. The format isn't isn't <coughs> going away from this point well, forward. The program that reads it, it state drops the current version of software. How do you get at the data that's in that old format? Well, the, I mean, the, right, the data is actually maybe, housed on a CD-ROM in essence. So yeah, all yeah, but we have it actually in two just, places: a CD-ROM as well as the yeah, um, state software. So if we ever go back and want to look at different fiscal years, a lot of times I use that CD-ROM, which is all saved you know, data that's available. So if the state software redesign, you know, goes away, we have all of that CD-ROM software that's always going to sit in that virtual cloud, that data warehouse that we can always click on and see different fiscal years and different reports that we have. So essentially each month when we close, there's something like 20 or 30 reports that are system generated that are put on the CD-ROM for the USAS side and a lot of reports from payroll side as well. And they sit there every month. So when we close, um, okay. November, December, January. The we don't, reports, yeah. So, yeah. so you don't have the raw data sitting out there. You have the report. We have both. And if some sort of a format, yes. an ASCII format or something, yeah. can easily be read by oh, yeah. virtual editor. Yeah, the, um, the, the, okay. PDF, uh, the, uh, the PDFs of the, the, uh, the PDFs. that I include are you know from those uh, CD-ROM um, okay. aspects of data. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's actually housed in two places. So. If I'm working in the system and I say I want to see, you know, all the expenses for the football field for the last 30 years or 20 years, I can only go back so far for, you know, the data aspect. I think it's like 20 years or something like that. Um, and I'm just not sure from the new system if I'm going to be able to run a report quickly to see all that. But I can always go back to the CD-ROM and pull it all up and you know, all the you know, work your way through. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I understand that. Thank you. Um, and then the uh, the other discussion piece, and I really want to, you know, it, I'll have the, everybody else take the lead more on this one, is um, kind of discussing um, a potential, you know, where we're at with just, um, 
you know, the capital improvement project, as well as our general operating, you know, need for a levy that's out there in the future. Um, you know, we had heard at um, the past board meeting from Enos Britton, as well as from GPD um, Retzel, uh, Galen was there. Uh, so we heard all the different types of levies that are out there, the bond and permanent improvements. Um, we know that we hired GPD to do an assessment of the district, which they did. Um, we're looking at approximately 50 million in total. Um, you know, a certain question comes up, well, how are we gonna fund to accomplish, you know, any portion of that 50 million? And we know that um, we're gonna have operating needs into the future. Our five-year forecast is healthy at this point, um, but we do know at least in my eyes, one of the most significant pieces is the phase out of the TPP that we lose about $200,000 every year. So the need for a levy is gonna be there because we are losing revenue. Um, we know expenses increase with inflation as we have. Um, one goal that I would, you know, as we talk about this, um, you know, we heard from the bond side and we heard from the permanent improvement side. And I'll just kind of throw my two cents out and everybody um, hopefully go to is, um, you know, a goal would be, you know, maybe we can take one away, you know, right now off the table as we start talking about, you know, funding that capital improvement. We know that there's going to be operating needs out there, you know, into the future, but just focusing right now on, you know, capital improvements, um, you know, two ways to fund that would be a permanent improvement levy or a bond issue that we would have. Um, just from my viewpoint, and I'll pass this down, um, is, you know, I, the way I see it, um, you know, to me, for that $50 million project, in my eyes, um, you know, I wouldn't go the route of a bond issue. I would go the route of a permanent improvement issue. Let me explain uh, why I'm looking at it that way. Um, debt. Um, we have no debt right now as a school district. If we have a bond issue, we're tacking on a lot of debt for the school district. And we can only borrow a certain portion um, against our valuation. Our valuation is about 388 million. And of that, we can only legally borrow a certain percentage of that. So we're talking approximately 20 million. Um, so we can never get to the $50 million amount, you know, from a district-wide assessment that we have. So a bond issue, we can't even borrow the full 50. We can only borrow a certain portion of that, which approximately 20 million at this point. There's different overlapping aspects that you can do to maybe increase that a little bit, but not by much. You're never going to get to 50 million. Maybe, maybe you could get to 30 million if you do some, you know, um, aspects in ORC that allow um, to get that. Um, but again, we have no debt right now as a district. If you're borrowing 30 million, think about, you know, 35% is going to be interest. On that. And that's just money going straight out to the banks that, you know, we don't have. So the interest portion is just, when I look at it, just from my lens, you know, I would stay away from it. Um, we're not looking to build any new school buildings. We're looking to stay in our current structure. Um, all we're doing is really taking it from good to great. So we're sitting in good buildings right now, and they're good because, you know, they've been here for 50, 60, maybe more years. Easy. So they're, they're not, you know, in new condition, but they're very good. They've been taken care of, you know, very good over the years. Um, you know, we want to take them, you know, keep them in that status, you know, uh, or even spruce them up, you know, if we redo certain aspects of it. Um, you know, if we're, if we're not building like a different level or a different wing or a completely new school building, you know, to go out to the public and say, we want to borrow $20 million as a bond issue, uh, but it's all going to be behind the scenes and we're still same, staying in the same shell that we have you know, people are really seeing, you know, what's going to happen with, you know, all those new funds where I think, uh, you know, from an improvement levy could be good. Um, and then a couple, you know, if I'm talking about the drawbacks from a bond issue, some of the benefits from a permanent improvement levy would be um, we pay as we go. You know, it's an old concept, but I think it's a very good concept that, you know, we're paying cash, we're saving up, and we're prioritizing all these projects that we have to complete we're saying, okay, we're going to save up for this one this year. We're going to save up for that one in that year. At the same time, we're collecting interest. We're not paying interest out. We're collecting it on any, you know, potential permanent improvement levy that we have continuing to fund uh, aspects of that project. Um, you know, maybe it's a minimal inconvenience that we have as we do these projects spread out over the years. Um, if we had a massive bond issue, we're building, 
you know, a whole new high school, we're talking about swing space. We have modular, modular units, maybe in certain aspects that, you know, educate the students. Um, you know, that's a, there's a lot of disruption there when you go that route. Um, you know, maybe as we're talking about the pay as you go, it's a minimal um, inconvenience that we could potentially have kind of behind the scenes as we go to you know, redo lighting or plumbing. Um, and then we're keeping up with the mantra of no debt. <clears throat> if we do um, a PI levy and we kind of do the pay as you go. So we would still continue to have no debt as a school district. And again, that's just my two cents. I kind of wanted to pass it around for the else. Yeah, essentially, what we're going to do is we want to take the bond off the table right now. Stop, mm -hmm. not not spend any more time investigating it because we, we don't think that that's the viable option for us. Some sort of accommodation of, of PI and operating is, is the direction. So we, but we're looking for from the board of some direction on that. Just in, in for all the reasons that Matt just stated, I won't. You know, in my opinion, it's real easy. I agree completely. What's that? I don't. I don't want to see a bond either. Okay. I, okay. I agree. I'm, I'm agree. Yeah. Absolutely, we don't want to go with that. Yeah. We, we still do have to get serious though about needs versus wants. And that because uh, how much does one mill bring in? One mill brings in approximately three hundred and fifty thousand. So it's three mills per million times fifty. Mm -hmm. A lot of millions. Well, and, but, we, but we also we also <laughs> know the number. A lot of millions. I can numbers. tell you the number right now is below fifty because yeah. Yeah, just yeah. with Doctor Claris's uh, and, and just as we start and, and that's the that's part of the, what the next step forward is. But let, let's stop talking about a bond issue. Let's let's talk about what we have done. Let's talk about our priorities then with right. Jason. We know that, we also know that uh, uh, LED lighting is return on investment. So we want to put that towards the front mm -hmm. of it. Those are all discussions that we need to have right. and work that PI operating money into that plan then. Yeah. But let's take bond off the table mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and let's, let's kind of narrow our focus on this. So we can yeah, so we can come up with some concrete numbers and a, yeah. and a concrete priority list. Yeah. It's time to start moving. Yeah, I would, I would agree, and, and I would also you know echo uh, Matt's comments, which is that one of the things that I don't think we really focused on is that with uh, the transaction costs on a bond are seemingly so much more than if we do a levy. We had Mr. Calendar up tonight, and he's talking about helping us write the levy language, but we're going to do the hard work of prioritizing the projects, costing them out with the architect's assistance, and and putting that schedule together. Whereas if you you have to hire a bond counsel to review the language, someone has to sell the bonds, and then you got to pay the interest. So I'm I'm fully in agreement with what you, your idea. Right. So I guess our next step, though, is to start sitting down, as you just described, and, and start going through the list and what is on a, the real list and what is really achievable and how many years do we want to spread this out and then translate that into a dollar value and take that back into mills mm -hmm. and then add in what do we think we need for operating in the same time. I mean, that that's all I like work that we all have to do. And, that's, and we'll start and next week by bringing Jason back in. We We haven't talked to Jason in a couple of weeks because... We needed to get some of these other things, some direction of this. We're going to bring Jason back in next week and start to talk about it more focused as I go out to start to talk to the villages. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 we hear what those, again, reinforce what priorities, maybe another priority pops up in some of these conversations that we can take into account as we do this. But those all work together uh, in the next month and a half. Right. Okay. And, you know, to, to help... Uh, Tom and Matt do their jobs. I would ask the other board members: Is there anyone that wants to have a further discussion about bonds or has questions that we haven't yet discussed that would help help them either get more comfort with what they're proposing or want to revisit the bond idea? This is really a decision we should make soon, so we can give them the guidance without them thinking that we might have second thoughts or misgivings about the direction we're asking them to go. So is there anyone else that, that has any particular concerns or a strong interest in revisiting something about the bonds or? I, I don't at all. I mean, no, actually, I, 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 I think bonds are not the way to go at this point. No, no I think we're okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just, yeah, I think we're out too. Starting okay. Bond. All right. We're good. No bond. Next. Bond. Next. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's all yeah. I have for tonight is just that one goal. So okay. now that we know that bonds off the tip, we wanted to give an overview of everything. So, right. so okay. we're well informed, right. which we you well, know, and I think it's yeah. also for the public to hear right. the different options, what's out there, what, you know, what direction we're going in and why. Like, I, I think we've done a good job of, oh, you know, talking about what the options are. I, I think we've done a fantastic job for where we're at. Now we have a clear goal in mind that, you know, we're working on, uh, you know, permanent improvement as a structure for, you know, financing and planning out how we want to accomplish, you know, all those um, items that were in the capital improvement plan that we're looking at. 
go back to the board with more, you know, concrete direction. Yeah. And he, even with a brief talk with Gail the other day, uh, and, and her colleague, uh, just, she just reinforced the fact that we don't have that. What a strong card that is for us and in, in, in our five year forecast. Well, she, she just, in a, like in a very brief <clears throat> meeting, she just kind of reinforced and actually she kind of, kind of, came under the assumption that we were going to talk about a bond and we took that off the table in the beginning of the conversation but she really did kind of reinforce that we were on she was on the right path with this now we it's going to take some work and crafting it as we move forward but that that again i i uh, her, her expertise uh carries a lot of weight with me just because of the number of issues that she's been through is actually she's working on four or five right now in North, northeast ohio uh, and this uh presentation that was attached to the agenda uh, a couple of the pages, like right near, way at the end, there's the review of final needs assessment. And there's two pages there. One of them talks about the one to five, five to 10, 10 plus year, what you would spend per building and the grand totals. And then the next one takes it by task, HVAC, roofing, electrical, and so on, and shows it over all the buildings with totals. Somehow it would be nice to be able to Put those together. That's what we're doing. And that, and that's, that's, what, a, that's what the conversation oh, yeah. will be with Jason. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because, because that, we, that's what I need. Mean. Oh, and that's what I need. Mean. Yeah. 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 This is just a brief PowerPoint presentation that was used to kind of, you know, get the message out to the public right. that we have nothing immediate and this is what it looks like. Just from a quick, you know, couple page PowerPoint that we go through. But yeah, what we're doing right now is kind of we're, in essence, what I'm going to do sitting with Tom is we're going to structure our five year forecast. I'm going to, essentially forecast 10 or 15 years out for operating money. And that's going to be the op operating side. Then working with Tom and GPD group, we're going to look at rows and columns for capital improvements. We're going to take all the data that they assessed and we're going to say, okay, these are all the projects and how they tie in and, and all the different ripples. Because if you do one thing, you want to see what else goes with right. it. And that's where their expertise comes well, in. GPD did that for us at one time. They, they so, did like a 10-year map right. out. But it, it really, based on some of the things that are, are, have come up, it, it, it's not applicable. It's not, but it's he, not he also knows that that's a format that we're going to revisit. Okay. And, and and so we, yeah. we he did at one point in time. Jason brought that to us uh, several weeks ago. And we said, yeah. This is good, but this is not the way it's going to lay itself out right now. We'll, but we'll come back to this format. Yeah. So. And that map out is exactly kind of what I need to forecast out and say, okay, this is the amount that we would go for any right. type of a levy. So it's adding up of what those costs are going to be. So the rows are projects, yeah. the years are columns. So we're going to say we're totaling <clears throat> this one column. This is year one, year two, year three. Right. And this is what we're thinking we're going to be able to generate per year. And then we fit those projects in with what we think we're going to generate. Right. And that's how we map it out. To accomplish everything, I and mean, we're talking years, this is going to be 20, 30 years. So we're just starting the way, but we're building a great foundation. I think it's much the way. same way that the roofing project's been done over the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. It's been constant, it, 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 and it's kept things up to date. And I think that that's the approach that we're going to take with right. the buildings moving forward. It's going to be a, it's going to be an, and, and if you have a continuing PI level, you're going to be able to do that yeah. on an ongoing basis. And the same with the roofs. When we've had big projects, we might have put them off for a year or two, so we kind of grouped it at one time and, and then spaced some of the smaller ones out and then brought it. It's, it's going to be much the same approach sure. district-wide with heating, HVAC, right. uh, electricity, yeah. plumbing, and the whole. Essentially, we take very, very similar to what we've done with the roofing project over the last 35 years, and now we're going to translate that to the entire district. Right. And know, that, and know we'll what funds that we have to work with on, a, on an ongoing basis. Right. We're going to do it by category. Yes. Not, we've got roofing, yeah. we've got HVAC, we've got electrical, we've got plumbing. Absolutely. They're all going to be there. They're all going to be ongoing, long-term projects, and we'll supply some PI money to yes. to uh, work uh, work through the issue. And and everything will be prioritized, just like the roofing. Got to fix this one first. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's why. Okay, I'm good. That's the direction. Okay. That's what we need to, move, to do to move forward, I think. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans, Superintendent's business. Ready. 10, employment. Uh, motion to approve employment of Christina Andrak as a substitute pool manager effective January 26, 2020, per the adopted hour, uh, hourly rate, step 4, 1364 per hour, contingent upon successful completion, BCI, FBI fingerprint checks. B, approve employment. Motion to approve employment of Dan G. and Grandi as a student monitor, bus attendant, not to exceed five hours per week, effective March 2, 2020, for the remainder of the 1920 school year, per the adopted uh, monitor wage schedule step one having successfully completed BCI FBI background checks. Uh, 11 employment A 
Motion to approve employment of the following educational related supervisors for the eighth grade Washington, D.C. trip to be held April 7th through 9th, 2020, per the adopted supplemental pay schedule. Dan, uh, Danielle Connors, Desiree Siley, Joel Kovich, and Dan DeRazio. B, approve employment. Uh, motion to approve the employment of the attached list of personnel in the stipulated positions on a one year supplemental contracts for 1920 school year per the adopted supplemental salary schedule contingent upon successful completion. BCI, FBI, fingerprint background checks if applicable. C, approve employment, motion to approve employment of Elena Paparizos as a home instruction tutor for 2019-20 on an as-needed basis per the adopted hourly rate. 12, A, uh, motion to approve the following volunteers to chaperone the eighth grade Washington DC trip April 7th through 9th, 2020. George Burick, assistant principal, and Dr. Ted Claris, assistant superintendent, I like the volunteer term there. Yeah. Is, that, is that volunteer mm -hmm. or volunteer, Ted? I'm volunteer. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> motion to approve employment of the following individuals on long-term teacher assistance uh, remainder of 2019-20 school year effective February 13th, 2020 per the daily substitute rate contingent upon successful completion of BCI FBI fingerprint checks. One, Amy George. Two, Eric Gendry. Uh, C, approved substitute teacher list is updated by the e, uh, ESC, uh, effective 2020. Agreements, contracts, and memberships. Approved agreement with Vocational Services Unlimited for, for the summer. Motion to approve an agreement with Vocational Services Unlimited for Cog Heights High School to be a site option for VSU Summer Youth Career Exploration and Work Experience Program for the summer of 2020. B, approved agreement with Everstream Solutions LLC for installation of fiber optic lines. Motion to approve the attachment. Uh, regarding the installation of fiber at no cost to the district. C, motion to approve the purchase of an 84 passenger school bus from Cardinal Bus Sales and Service uh, per fall bus bid from the Ohio Schools Council, including trading of bus number eight at a cost of 95,233 per the attachment. D, a motion to approve the attached community use of school facilities application form regulations and rental fees as revised. And E, approve application for overnight field trip uh, for the varsity baseball team to travel to Wright State University for two college, uh, actually it's two high school contests that on March 27th and 28th, we're not playing a college team. We're, we'll be playing Sydney Lehman High School at, uh, at, uh, at Wright State University. I ask that those be approved via the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the, Mr. Evans's consent agenda. Second. Second. Mr. Name and second. Uh, is there any discussion? Just going back through the pool, substitute manager. Uh, we've, uh, uh, Mr. Calber's got a great relationship with the, uh, with the rec director over at Seven Hills. So when we needed uh, uh, a lifeguard for the open house, uh, Jen Berger uh, talked to one of her staff members. Uh, we're going to cultivate that relationship a little bit more. Lifeguards have been hard to come by. If we can offer some time for them here, and, and then Seven Hills, I think that's more lucrative for those lifeguards. So uh, I, I, I urge Ryan to, to continue to cultivate that relationship and, mm -hmm. and uh, offer make some offerings for those some of the lifeguards. And we, as we know through the years, lifeguards have been tough to come by here. Yeah, um, so did I, by the way. I encouraged him to do the same yeah. thing. So, you know, Jen's a long time. I've known Jen for, and her husband for probably 20 years, so that's, that's a good contact for us. She won't admit to 20 years, but it's been that long. <laughs> Um, student monitor, um, uh, uh, Dan G. and Grandy to be a bus antenna. We had a resignation, so Dan was going to fill that in for the remainder of the year. He's already here working with a student during the day. He'll now also uh, work, uh, uh, fill as a bus attendant as well. The uh, DC trip advisors, we were kind of laughing. Mr. Durazio is uh, talking about retirement this year. And I said, that, 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 Dan, did you really volunteer to do this? He goes, Yeah, one last time I want to go to DC. And I, so uh, we're teasing Dan about that a little bit. But uh, uh, that, that's uh, uh, happy to see that. Supplemental contracts that you see there, those are uh, assistant coaches for spring sports uh, as listed. Um, Elena Paparizos, you know, we brought Elena on after the first year through the ESC. Uh, we've got some home instruction that is going to require some uh, special needs uh, expertise, and Elena already works with that student during the day, so we just thought that might be a natural for her to then follow up with that student. Um, the volunteer chaperones, as I said, uh, uh, George and uh, Dr. Calaris uh, attending as well. Um, Long-term substitute teaching assistants. <coughs> These are people that are moving into teaching assistant positions because the teaching assistants have moved into long-term subs, one for... Uh, uh, or for two of our elementary teachers that are on extended uh, absences right now. And the substitute teacher list, which you see monthly. 
the agreement with vocational services that's for up to five students uh, that they uh, that will work uh, uh, 20 hours a week special needs students here on site um, that they'll that actually get paid through the uh, vocational services uh, and but we would work them into our summer maintenance clean staff but nice opportunity for some of our handicapped students mm -hmm. uh, everstream solutions is a replacement of some fiber optic line at no cost to us the school bus purchase uh, um, that's that's kind of a price that's going to hold that lock that price in for us. And what I just found out in Columbus this week is that we may be eligible for a one-time forty thousand dollar grant from the state. Um, essentially, what the state did is uh, they had so many million dollars. They they took all the data that all the schools submit, and they're going to take the. It's going to be about four hundred districts that have the oldest fleets on the road, and they're just going to it's going to be right in that vicinity of forty thousand dollars. So. Cleveland's only going to get forty thousand dollars. We we may we may we may fall into that list. So that should be out, and that they're just going to notify us through CCIP. They didn't we didn't have to fill out any kind of application or anything. That's just going to be that's just going to be. So if that shows up, Ted, I want you'll know where that came from. But um, with the based on the age of our fleet, we 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 may well qualify for uh, for that for which would cover half the price of that bus, and we will yeah, certainly yeah, take it. Would we know if that bus would or would not have seatbelts? Does not have seatbelts. Does not no. have seatbelts, and I, that's seat the, the only discussion that we'll entertain yeah. I, I, in during my comment section. Um, I'll, I'll certainly uh, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the seatbelt. Um, but that is without that was not with, with seatbelts. I think you're probably looking at about twelve thousand dollars more to the cost of that bus. But we had priced that out before uh, the presentation was ever done. In the community use for school facilities application, and that was just adjusted. Uh, we had to include uh, update that that has to be approved by you annually uh, per. Uh, um, per our policy for the uh, use of the school facilities. Did you change? I thought I saw on there's, that. There's a couple a few, there's a, we have to sign. Right. Yes. Now. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's and fine. then the overnight trip for the baseball team, uh, you know, that's, I, I told uh, Mr. Kelber, I told Coach Solomon that that's one of the uh, best done overnight trip requests that I've seen. And we've had veteran people in the district not be able to, Put those together, and he did a fantastic job, and it's very clear and concise, and uh, it looks like looks like a great trip, and, uh, and and kudos to Coach Solomon for putting that together. So, any questions? Uh, do we need to actually make a formal modification to that motion, or just create as a typo? I'm, I'm not sure because the, the actual the trip it, it's in the trip request. It doesn't say college, so it's that, okay. It doesn't really matter who they're playing. No. It's more the fact that they're yeah. going, where yeah. they're going. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, I would comment that the Evergreen Solutions, uh, Dave, you want to fill us in just a little bit on that? But mine, from what you told us earlier, we're going to get our own fiber coming into the building underground, right? Is it? Uh, it's overground. Overground. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any other discussion or comments on the superintendent's agenda? Having heard none, uh, may I have a motion to approve Mr. Revan's agenda? No, we, do oh, we did. Okay. So now it's roll call. Thank you. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mr. Naiman. Aye. Mrs. Edder. Aye. Mrs. Cooper. <coughs> Uh, the motion passes 5-0. Aye. Oh, I'm Aye. sorry, Jackie. <laughs> I thought I heard my name. I, I apologize. Aye. I apologize. I apologize. Uh, so now the motion passes 5-0. Uh, superintendent's discussion and comments. Um, one of the things that, you know, based on Mr. Bregley's uh, presentation on the seatbelts, there's a couple of things that I, in, in the essence of time, I did not want to kind of get into a debate with him when he was here, but uh, some things I want the board to understand. Uh, first and foremost, 95% of our bus routes do not exceed 35 miles an hour um, because of where we're at. Uh, certainly, all the instances that he uh, posed to you are very tragic instances, but if you take a look at them, um, actually only one or two of them were actually high school buses. The other were travel coaches, and they were all over the road or interstate type accidents. Um, uh, certainly, uh, um, I, I, I would not disregard his data, but um, I did tell Mr. Dobbins, uh, Bob Scott at uh, 
at Avon Lakes, a, a friend, as is Bob Hardis at Beechwood, and I, I will take this. I'm going to reach out to both of them and say, can you give me some data on your seatbelt stuff? What, what was it? What was your thought process? What are you? Where are you headed with this? Uh, what was your rationale behind some of this stuff? So I already had that discussion with Mr. Dobbins, and I'm going to. I would like to spend the next year or so just kind of reaching out and seeing what where that is uh, in in a, in and just the, the entire cost involved because cost we got range anywhere from eight thousand to fifteen thousand to for the installation of the seatbelts in the in the um in the buses yeah Lindy. can you add to like how do they enforce it like to me mm -hmm. i almost see it hiring like another position of like right. a bus attendant mm -hmm. to enforce it so like I guess if you if you're talking to them, you know how do they enforce it? Do they not? Yeah, that, that's a, that's an excellent point because I I just happened to notice we we were off one day and I was watching I was watching Avon's buses roll and as Avon's buses went by me and they've got Avon's got a huge fleet of buses every bus had at least one aid on it several buses had two and three aids on it so every bus had aids on it. now they don't have seat belts. But just from the standpoint of just having AIDS ride buses, now, I, Dr. Clares, do we have any AIDS ride any of our regular runs? Uh, just our special just our special ed runs. So, uh, I, so as a superintendent, I, obviously the cash register in my head is mm -hmm. kind of yeah. well, and I'm wondering what else. Now, I, I know Mike Lobb very well at Avon. I was going to ask Mike <laughs> about the, uh, and actually his uh, um, HR person I know as well. So I was going to inquire just about some of that uh, in. If I brought the bus people and the people that do the bus driver training, and I said this to Mr. Dobbins, I took the training uh, back many years ago, and they spent a, an entire half a day talking about why you don't want seatbelts in buses. Uh, one was because if you have young children and they panic, they can't get the seatbelts undone, and if the bus driver is injured, you have no one to be able to. So essentially, kids are trapped in buses. Let's say a bus goes on its side. Uh, and, and then uh, um, and even if you do, uh, if, you, if the bus driver has the, 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 the cutaway uh, piece of equipment, the amount of time that it takes to, for a bus driver to cut the students out of seat belts. So there was a time a factor involved with accidents that they, this is what they used to cite. And again, I, I, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to follow up with some of that data, but those were some of the reasons they said why you don't want to do that. You want the students to be able to exit the bus as quickly as possible in the event of some sort of accident. We go through a lot of, and we and we diligently go through our training with uh, our exit, doing the bus evacuations here every fall. Um, once we start our runs uh, in the back of the elementary building, they, they, they do spend a lot of time and effort going through side exits, back exits, all those types of scenarios uh, and training the students. I, I would too would question, you know, the, the ability to, uh, um, and, and our students are really more compliant than a lot of district students are, but to, to it's always the student that you have the issue with is the one that doesn't have a seatbelt on, and and so now that how do you how do you monitor that? How do you control that type of thing? So there, there's a lot of things to look at. I, I think there's certainly some merit to it, uh, but this is one of those that uh, for for all the things that the state's pulling dollars and cents away from us, and if, if the state feels strongly in this, number one, make a legislation. Number two, add dollars to it. Um, and, and you're, we have, we've talked long and hard about unfunded mandates and, and, and where we get swamped with them. And as we sit here and talk about building renovations and what have you, that's fifteen to fifteen thousand dollars for seatbelts. While that, while that certainly has merit to it, but I can also think of a lot of other places I can spend fifteen thousand dollars in the district and do our students some good too. So it's weighing those things out as a board and as an administration as a, where that where those funds are best used at. So. I, I would, I, I guess we, just, just to say, I don't see us that, that we have a lot of discretionary money, is, for lack of a better term. Um, again, it has some merit to it. I, I think that uh, I will follow up with Bob Scott and, and, and Bob Hardis um, and, and ask, and, and just, I'll see both of them. Bob, I see a lot more, uh, Hardis, I see a lot more frequently, but to say, hey, well, how'd, you, how'd you come around with this? Mm -hmm. what, 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 so, something there. that I was thinking of too, you know, is it maybe something that we look at where it's just like we get a couple buses to where like the sports teams and things like that that travel on the freeway? That was my first thought so was if, if you're going to start with if you're going to start with some you start yeah. with the buses that that we do the athletic trips with yeah. right. that the, yeah. those are the buses yeah. that and it, I, it's funny because I said as I talked to Kathy Topovich I said you know the buses aren't for you she goes heck even on for you they don't get over thirty five miles an hour because our buses are always traveling when. Yeah. At, at high traffic times, so we're, we're sending a bus over Richmond Heights at 
four o'clock in the afternoon, it's never getting over 35 miles an hour between here and Richmond Heights, as much as we want it to sometimes because the 48271 traffic. And she said that tongue in cheek, but there's a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. um, but but certainly if that was if you were going to start at a place, you'd start with the buses that were might have a higher uh, possibility of having some kind of incident involved with that. And those would be the ones that you know do the traveling. And, and as our conference gets bigger. We're, we're doing a little bit more travel. We're doing a little bit more over the travel. There's 22 schools in our conference as of next year or so. Yeah, that would be the place where you would use them. Yes. Unless, if you use that on an ordinary run, you probably wouldn't even bother with the seatbelt, but you'd use them when you're on the road. But just perhaps. As a starting place, so yeah. I, I will we'll follow up with that, though. Right. Some other things that I had. Uh, just the, I, I did not testify, and I, and I told Mr. Dobbins, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I did not testify is that, you know, we had met with um, – uh, Senator Dolan before Christmas, and I think I told you about how that meeting went. And Senator Dolan essentially was the author of Senate Bill Nine, and and uh, I was at a meeting today. And the difficulty with that is that uh, he represents us, and essentially Bassa wanted us to come out in, in favor of House Bill Eighty Nine, which is the opposite bill. And and, and quite honestly. Uh, Senator Dolan did everything we asked of him in that meeting. When we met with Senator Dolan, the three of us, he said, give me one item to work on. Give me one topic. He goes, I can't address ADC. I can't address the Ed Choice vouchers. I can't address. Give me one thing that, that to focus on that will have an impact across the board. And we said the report card. We said either getting it right or getting rid of it. Get, but fixing the report card, because then schools wouldn't be on academic distress. They wouldn't, buildings wouldn't qualify for the Ed Choice voucher. So that was what our focus was. And that essentially what his legislation was. So to go down and testify contrary to that, I, I, I didn't really want to do that because he's been a strong supporter of ours. And Greg Gurka at North Walton said the exact same thing. And Bill Wagner from, from Fair Reserve, Bill said the same thing too. So essentially what I, and, and we had back to back phone conferences with the, the first ring school district lobbyists and then the Alliance lobbyist, right? I had him back to back, and it's almost comical that I hung up the phone and made it a second call. And what my comment was in both of those is, and it was also at the finance committee meeting, is that is that this is one's bad legislation, the other's worse legislation. So there there isn't a good option for us. Uh, and and just a couple of points that I want the board to be aware of. Uh, Senator Huffman, in my eyes, uh, from Alabama, uh, who's vying to be the the, the, the uh, Senate head of the Senate, it, it, he, he's going to be dangerous to public education, and he's made it very clear that his number one, two, and three priority is, is vouchers, and and he's made it very clear to his colleagues that if you're not with him, um, he won't he will cast you aside. So that that's a little bit scary, and also from the standpoint that we want to now expand a voucher system. Do you understand that the voucher system was only used at sixty percent last year? Only sixty percent of the vouchers got used. But yet we want to expand it. Uh, that doesn't make, make any sense to me. And the, and the expansion here, here's, here's just one last bit of food for thought. The 250% of the poverty level. Do you realize that students will be eligible for vouchers, but not be eligible for free and reduced lunches in their schools? That's so that just tells you a, 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 some of the flaws in what's being discussed right now. So. I, I don't, I'm not sure where it's going, and, and uh, um, uh, we, they talked about a state house rally on March 18th when we're down for the legislative day. I think I think uh, uh, the school boards association, BASA, OASBO, are all trying to put that together, but they don't want to do it unless they can get a couple thousand people there. Now we will be down for the legislative day, and that's on the agenda here a little bit for any any board members who want to attend, and we've been down there before. But uh, uh, you know, and I told them we would be in tennis. I'd have probably four members, and I. I also uh, went to the uh, president of the teachers union today and said, listen, I'd be willing to sub four teachers out if four teachers want to go down and attend too, because actually OEA is in support of the, of the rally as well. So, um, but that's just where it is. And it's, uh, like I said, in my, in my eyes, it's bad and worse. And, and, and I said this to both groups. And of course, I got the gentleman from Crooksville sitting in front of me, who might be one of the poorest school districts in the state of Ohio as I'm having the conversation. But I understand this, we, have this, we had a student two years ago uh, go to St. Ignatius when he got in the ninth grade. And that's that's all well and good, but understand that when that student was here at Cuyahoga Heights, we got $688 for that student from the state of Ohio. That when he went to St. Ignatius, St. Ignatius got $1,200 for that student because every parochial school, any 
in the state, every student in the state of Ohio gets a $1,200, they call it a maintenance fee. That's not including the vouchers. That has nothing to do with the vouchers. So you tack a voucher on top of that, that's now $7,200 that they get. And realize that the elementary schools that get $4,000, many of the parochial schools don't even charge that. The parochial schools are talking about raising their fees in the elementary building so they get the entire voucher. But some of them don't even charge $4,000. Some of them charge less than that for, for students. So they're talking about raising their fees so they can collect the entire voucher. That that's that's insanity in my eyes. It just and when we haven't publicly we haven't, you know, and and, and Cup Patterson's still alive, but we're, we're saying to people 305, a hospital 305, why are we talking about vouchers when you haven't addressed 305? Please let, let's let's get 305 first to Cup Patterson. And that's not gonna be a windfall for us, but it'll be better. But but that 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 makes sense. There's some logic, there's some rationale behind 305. So that's my nickel's worth on legislation, so. Well, thank you for that. And, and I would just say that I'm very new to the education um, business and funding, and it, it helps me to get your comments given your experience in this field. So uh, feel free to, to, in fact, I invite you to share your comments as, as you- More than I would like right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I can imagine, I, I sense your frustration. I, I share the same frustration, but I, I, don't, I come from it from a position of, of knowledge, weakness, whereas you have the strength. So thanks for sharing it with us. Um, board resolutions. Uh, we oh. have two tonight. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost track of my, I get so excited there. I'm, <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, professional meeting request. Uh, there, this, that's this, you see the state legislative uh, on March 18th. That's from nine to one, and actually that afternoon, then we would schedule appointments with any of our legislators that were down there. We've done that in the past. Mm -hmm. Again, Senator Dolan's always welcome us. Uh, Senator uh, Representative Robinson uh, and Crossman have both been uh, very, uh, very good about it. So, uh, but. Uh, I will put that in for approval and then board members, as you check your schedules, it's just a matter of letting Sandy know and we'll get everybody registered. I know Mark's already, Mr. Dobbins has already said he can make it down that day. Mm -hmm. If you can, we'd love to have you. Um, that doesn't involve anything, no transportation, like, I mean, not transportation, no hotel or anything. No, like that's, that. we so go down that morning, come back that afternoon. Okay. That's a, that's a down back. I will not be available. Okay. Um, and that's what the second attachment to that is. Yeah, just an ex I've explanation of that. that. Before, and I'd, I'd like to do that again if I can. Yeah, we can just approve right now, and then as you check yeah. schedules, we, we can verify right. that. I've got till next the end of next week to register everybody. Okay. So now, does the board need to approve? Uh, I signed up and to go to that CBC uh, Mental Health Summit this coming week. Does the board need to approve that? Or we, we I think we've already. Uh, oh, we did. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Apologize. All right. Um, let's see. Board resolutions. Board, board policy adoptions, Mr. Evans, it's- Just uh, unless there's questions, I wasn't gonna go through each policy okay. because of the number. Yeah, and did so previously. Unless anybody had specific questions about those. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well then may I have a motion for approval of the board's consent agenda? So moved. Ms. Shuka moves. Second. Uh, Mr. Suchaki got the second this time. Okay, uh, <laughs> is there any discussion of these items? I think we've pretty much had our discussion as it went. Yeah. So with that, uh, may we have a roll call, please? <clears throat> Mrs. Shuker. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Mr. Naiman. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. The motion passes 5-0. Uh, board discussion committee comments reports. Um, Ms. Shuker, do you want to start? Sure. Um, finance committee met last week, um, or was it this week? Last week. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Yes. Um, met last week, and Mr. Evans and Mr. Muccio, um, really Mr. Evans, but Mr. Muccio had some good points too, um, shared um, the timeline and so forth with, you know, just the general um, ideas with the finance committee. Um, they are hungry for crunching numbers, and so it will fit right into the next step. Um, during this meeting, if you saw me typing, not only was I, my mouse wasn't working, but I also was sending out a doodle, a new invite to the finance committee. So we'll be meeting hopefully if all the stars are aligned um, in March sometime um, to look at those numbers and then to ultimately give recommendations to the board based on, um, you know, type of levy, not type of levy, but how much. And I don't think we're focusing on prioritizing, but who knows, there might be some conversation in that too. 
That's all I've got. Very good. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> Chucky? Um, so we had a technology committee meeting this evening. We already talked about the, uh, the new uh, access to the building, the, the fiber optic access to the building. One of the other things we discussed was the fact that the use of Chromebooks is increasing. You know, more teachers are using them more often. Um, but to try to avoid um, spending a lot of uh, money on buying a lot of Chromebooks, what the plan is, is to take, you know, we recycle them. Every five years they get replaced. Well, when we buy the new ones this year, we just won't um, mark all the old ones out. We'll keep some of the older ones that are still in good shape so that we can add to the number of Chromebooks that we have so that the teacher use can go up as well. Um, so we're going to go in that direction, see how well that works. So instead of a five-year turnaround, we'll be doing a six, maybe even a seven-year turnaround um, with Chromebooks. Keep them longer. Do they last that long? Like, really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they really yeah. This summer, two of them have to be replaced. We can't use them anymore. The three that are not, the three we're keeping in the rotation. So that's okay. where we're increasing the, the inventory. But yeah, yeah, but those three that we're keeping will more than likely 21, 22 have to be replaced or be, right. be brought out of cycle. Right. And a cart has 30? 30. 30, yes. 30 Chromebooks on the cart. Is, is there a, actually a um, is there a, a timeline where it becomes unsupported, like the operating system or anything like that, like that we would actually have to replace them sooner? Or no? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that fits in the time on that. But for state testing, yep. uh, we cannot use the old one before that. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Classroom, we're also experimenting, minting with something called a Clever Touch interactive TV to replace some of the uh, older smart boards. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get a demonstration of how that works and what teachers can do with it uh, at a board meeting in uh, April or May. Dr. Claris will be working on that for us. Uh, we will not be buying anything with E-rate this year. E-rate does pay about 40, 43% uh, toward what we purchase, but of course we have to purchase the rest of it. You know, we have to put out 60% or so to buy the stuff. And right now we have no specific needs that would fall under E-rate reimbursement. However, next year, there will be some plans to move forward. E-rate is changing a little bit the way they, they refund and what they help pay for. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, we'll probably be looking into making some up, uh, upgrades and using E-rate to help pay for it. Um, link, uh, and there are also some improvements coming on redundancy. Uh, buying another server to back up so that when things go down, we have something in place that can take over and we don't see the outage, such as was seen this afternoon, which of course that wouldn't have helped that at all. Uh, but uh, the internet was down for five hours today, apparently, and it caused all sorts of interesting challenges in the building. And it turned out to be uh, somebody who plugged something into the wrong place. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Ms. Edder? Um, so I was just going to say that um, the capital conference, um, they're looking for um, learning proposals and people sharing their expertise. And I think we brought this up before about the best committee. It's already honored. It is. The be best, is, best has been honored. And then I'm hoping that we also uh, enter a uh, submission for our performers, maybe. So I'm trying to get a, a get all the time blown on one end of the drum line this year, see if we can get the, um, get a video, get a good video of the drum line. So. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, We'd like, like to it. see that because that's something like different. That, so I think that's really good. Um, I don't know if you, your name is your some yeah, your name is suggestion. So I don't know if we have any. Yeah, I think we have to get the arts and uh, the students too as well. Yeah. yeah and we, we've made. Are, are we going to do anything about going to the regional spring conference? We haven't. I haven't called Reno that. yet to see what's what's on the agenda there. Okay. He's usually pretty good. Because the ones. Uh, next week, March Question. 5th, and the other one, March 30th. Usually they invite us if there's someone yeah. from our school mm -hmm. recognized. So if we're not invited, yeah, there's you know, we receive the only thing that's possible is we recognized. <laughs> although it's not from 
OSBA, it, it's from the, the ODE, we got the Momentum Award, and I don't know yeah. if they were going to announce that, do that, where they were going to do that, because we haven't never received that award before, so I didn't know, I don't know if Meryl Johnson was going to show up at a board meeting and present that, or I, I don't, I haven't heard anything. Like I, I said, it's pretty good too of taking care, you know, of yeah. taking care of yeah, us. Yeah, you know, just that first lets us know what's going on. So, okay. thank you. Um, I didn't know. Did we? I saw that uh, we have the presentations to Brooklyn Heights on March third. Are we doing the capital improvement presentation to any of the other communities? Yet? Chicago Heights on March eleventh, and uh, Mayor Piasecki and I are now playing phone tag. So he called me, I called him back, and then he called me, and I haven't called him back. Okay. So he yeah. said. He said. He, we could come to a meeting, but he wanted to talk to me first, so I haven't booked the date yet. So. Okay. Maybe he's going to put you on a short time frame. I, I told him I didn't need a lot of time. <laughs> I would not interfere with this meeting. Um, I just want to uh, recognize um, our students that have um, taken the lead to be part of the Drug Free Club of America. I think that that's um, a wonderful opportunity, and uh, I'm glad that we're doing that here at our school. And always the highlight of my coming to these board meetings is the students of the month. And um, so keep inviting them to come because then I'll be coming to the board meetings. So <laughs> I enjoy that. Um, I, 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 you know, I take notes as, uh, as the kids are introduced. And I just wanted to uh, take note of the fact that we had a first grader who enjoys math and technology. So for the up. Uh, but just the idea that a first grader has the opportunity to have technology at that age, I think that says volumes about what we're doing at this school. <coughs> so, and you know, the other first grader who couldn't have done a more kind act. <coughs> um, I don't know. I'm glad that we have these students at our school and I'm, I'm glad that we have um, the staff that we do that, that works with these students every day. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mrs. Outer. Mr. Naaman. It's very simple. I just want to congratulate all the students of the month and then actually um, also congratulate the, um, the people from that, um, the Charlie members of the Dread um, Free Club of America. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just got one item and I just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Evans for inviting me to the staff's uh, professional development day on the 14th. Um, I caught the opening session where you kind of did a, a dry run of your capital improvements talk presentation and I'm glad that you had a chance to reach out to the staff and share your, your our thoughts with them about what, what we're planning. And of course, uh, it was nice to see Mr. Young and uh, he is uh, has some very strong uh, interest in this uh, revised uh, OTES program. So I, I learned a whole lot about evaluators' educations. <laughs> <laughs> I never realized it was that complex, but kudos to him and kudos to you. Thanks. That's all I have. Two, just two things I had left out. I, obviously, the sign's operational. I, I, I posted a 1977 picture of me standing in front of the old sign, and, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 then a now picture. But uh, um, uh, it's it, really we've worked out, we've gone through some. Uh, worked out a protocol on how we're going to get the information over to it and, and what uh, they're actually going to be able to next month with the students of the month uh, when the meeting's going on they're going to they're going to set it to run more often and then the, the students pictures will be with it so when the students either before the meeting or after go out and get their picture taken at the sign with their picture and their name on the sign right. <laughs> so, and uh, uh okay. I fear not that the old sign's not going in the garbage can i i saw some of them <laughs> but uh but I, I i actually my thought was to actually uh, have it uh, at graduation and put congratulations class of 2020 so they will bring it out front so they can get their picture taken with the old sign uh, oh, nice. as we do that. <laughs> and one last little plug, um, you know, Coach Tartaria had 12 seniors this year on the basketball team. And and, and uh, when you have a parent's life for 12 seniors, when you can only put five on the court at a time, can be sometimes very difficult. Well, he changed it up this year and he asked each of the uh, seniors to invite somebody that was important to them in their travels here at Cuyahoga Heights. And it was truly one of the neatest things that 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 has happened here in a long time. And just to the kids pick, uh, as you heard, uh, uh, they Pollock picked Dennis Gibson. And, and, the, and each of those staff members wore the, the student's jersey and they introduced them that night. Uh, Chris Bazidlo was uh, one of our students picked Chris Bazidlo. She, she, she was just, she was just mm -hmm. over the top. Uh, Nancy Wynerica was one of the staff members that was mm -hmm. picked. So they all, show, every one of them showed up that night and they lined up on the baseline and it was just a, uh, 
just a great, great thing. And I, you know, Mike, you know, he talked through it before he was going to do it with me. I said, Mike, it sounds great. It sounds, he goes, he goes, you got to see who the kids pick. And I said, that's fantastic. And that, to what you said, Maria, you know, our kids, it's not just about the math science teacher. It's about maybe who touched their life on the elementary building. And maybe it's about the custodian that was our bus driver mm-hmm. for six years like that. that, that they had little pearls of wisdom as they went. So, it, it, you know, it, it takes everybody. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that it, it truly does. And I, I think that just reinforces, you know, what Mrs. Schubert wants to get going with, recognize some of our staff members. Uh, like, uh, 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 but I just think yeah. that's, that's, that's just, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it could have been better. And, that, and, and it was a, we're, we're next meeting yeah. or next, yeah. like mm-hmm. next month. Yes. All yeah. Right. More, more, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, um, so just a great night. And, Again, Mike kind of just thought that up on his own, and it just worked out to be a fantastic night. So, I, I would say to that, I, I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. I, mean, I hope that that continues on as a tradition. Yeah. Do like, they do the parents too, or how did that work? So the parents were there too, right. and then like, were they recognized they, too? They got yeah. the flower, and oh, yeah. that was cool. And then, then that significant person that affected them in the score was wearing their jersey. I love it. And then actually, I think and every senior. There's another senior in the class that wore the jerseys of the of the kids, the other jersey, because yeah. they wore the special jerseys that night. They wore the flip jerseys, and then they oh. so the special invitee had a jersey, and then they picked a member of their senior class yes. to so also have had that too. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's really really cool. I mean, I, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that that should be a tradition that we carry forward. I, I loved it. Everyone will be in jerseys. Well, but it, it's it, it, it's it's kind of fun. It's just more than it's just. just the the uh, you know however yeah. many you know the, the the time on the court it's, it, it's a lot more yeah. than that yeah. it truly really is yeah. well that kind of segues into uh, possible future agenda items uh, Mr. Shuker was asking about uh, the status of the, yeah. the teachers plan um, are there any other uh, items for future agenda we we talked about the bus the seat belts that's going to yeah. be mm-hmm. much in the future uh, but hopefully we'll follow up on that. Uh, the OSBA put out uh, a request for uh, the business honor roll, and Mr. Evans and I, and I think I shared with you what, what my preliminary thoughts were, but uh, uh, it's nice to recognize that the businesses, I don't know if that requires any agenda on our part. Um, anything else? If not, then it should be known that the Board of Education members have received their agenda several days prior to the actual meeting, thus they have had considerable opportunity to study it, ask questions, etc. Upcoming board meetings, March 11th, 2020, April 8th, 2020, April 22nd, May 13th, May 27th, June 10th, June 24th, regular meetings uh, at 7 p.m. So that meeting at Cuyahoga Heights is on the same day as our board meeting. It's before, right. right. But it'll be right. right before. Yep. So what time, six? We don't, six. We're, we're not, okay. We don't have to go. Are we going to do like a rotating uh, thing? What I, what I would, uh, if we, if I can get a couple of board members of each of those, that'd be wonderful. And, uh, you know, we don't have a Cog Heights um, mm-hmm. board mm-hmm. member, but it, I usually do. If you want to show that, and then certainly the Brooklyn Heights, people, the people who live in Brooklyn Heights to show up to the Brooklyn Heights meeting, and mm-hmm. anybody from Valley View show up to the Valley View meeting when that's scheduled. Mm-hmm. So. so you're saying Cuyahoga Heights, same day as our board meeting, right. but you think it's, the presentation be at 6 p.m.? It is at 6. It is at 6. Is. Okay. It is at six. The, Cuy- yeah. the Brooklyn Heights one, though, is at 6.30. Correct, because okay. everything so that means it's not till seven. And it's what okay. day again, Tom? I'm sorry. Uh, the, three, the third three. for Brooklyn Heights and the eleventh for Cuyahoga three, Heights. Three, three. I, I usually do Cuyahoga Heights because we okay. own the property okay. here. So. Okay, very good. Uh, there is no executive session tonight, correct? No. Okay, well then uh, the next item would be uh, adjournment. Is there a motion for adjournment? Sure, why not? Did I miss something? <laughs> we'll get it right this time. Are we waiting for adjournment? Yes. Okay. Yes. Usually okay, motion for adjourn. So much. Okay, Ms. Shuka moves. Mr. Name a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. We are adjourned. It is 9 15 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.